Before moving on, I'd like to point out that two of today's speakers, Marion Charlton and Dr. David Sarur, are on the medical board of the National Kidney Registry. That's true, Ned. And to introduce our next speaker, we'd like to call upon NYPD detective Michael Lalo. But it turns out that Michael is most proud of his membership in a select group. That is the club of non-directed kidney donors. Hello, my name is Michael Lalo and I'm a detective in the NYPD's Intelligence Bureau. I have the privilege of introducing our next speaker, Marion Charlton. Marion started her transplant career in 1988 at Wild Cornell's Transplant Center in Manhattan. Marion recently left Wild Cornell as their Chief Clinical Transplant Coordinator and is now at the Hackensack University Medical Center as their Clinical Manager of their Living Donor Program. Most would say, and I surely agree, Marion is probably one of the best in her field. But that's not what makes her so special to me. In 2018, Marion was my Living Donor Coordinator when I donated my kidney to a stranger. Without her experience, knowledge and calming demeanor, I would not have had the experience that I had. I am so proud to introduce Marion Charlton, my living donor coordinator, and more importantly, my friend. Thank you for that kind introduction. In my 20 years of working with potential living donors, I have developed a tremendous admiration and respect for them. To give of oneself for the benefit of benefit of someone else is the true meaning of altruism and what better way to define it than the act of living donation. The first living donor transplant happened in 1954 at the what is now known as the Women and Brigham's Hospital in Boston. The twin brothers Richard and Ronald Henrik um, and the surgeon, Dr. Joseph Murray, performed the first living donor transplant between identical twins. Richard married um, his nurse, had two children, and lived for eight years after the transplant. He died from recurrent disease. His brother, Ronald, the donor, um, went on to live to age 79. He was a school teacher, and he died after a heart surgery. And you can see the twins here, and it's hard to actually figure out which is the recipient and which is the donor. The donor, Ronald, attended the transplant games many years ago, uh, wearing a t-shirt indicating that he was the first living donor. The consensus statement from JAMA in 2000 uh, determined that a living donor is a person who gives consent to be a live organ donor. They should be competent, willing to donate, free from coercion, medically and psychosocially suitable, fully informed of the risks and benefits as a donor, and fully informed of the risks, benefits, and alternative treatments available to the recipient. This is the principle of living donation that guides us in our practice and by which we evaluate all potential donors. UNOS has also given us very prescriptive policies which we need to adhere to when ev evaluating a potential living donor. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I would suggest taking a look at policy 14. CMS also guides us with regulatory oversight, and in 2007 issued the CMS Conditions of Participation, and the final rule, final rule established for the first time Medicare Conditions of Participation for Heart, Heart Lung, Intestine, Kidney, Liver, Lung, and Pancreas Transplant Centers. And the purpose was that it set forth rules and clear expectations for safe, high-quality transplant services delivered in a Medicare participating centers. So there are several di different types of living donors. You have living related, which is family, with cousins, parents, siblings, living unrelated, spouse, partner, friends, co-workers, and neighbors or church communities, and then altruistic, which are also known as Good Samaritan or non-directed donors. And they have no specific recipient in mind when they come forward to donate. So who can donate? Well, the person needs to be healthy, have no medical or psychosocial contraindications, willing, free from any type of inducement or coercion. And compatibility is no longer a factor as we have the option of entering paired exchange or doing blood type incompatible transplants. 
There are benefits associated with kidney transplantation. It allows a patient to be freedom from dialysis. They have fewer dietary restrictions and an improved sense of well-being. Kidney transplant patients' survival is significantly improved compared to those who remain on dialysis. There are emotional benefits for the donor. Kidney donors tend to have a higher quality of life scores after donation when compared to the general population. The personal experience differs for each donor, and donors have similar or improved psychosocial health after donation. All donors undergo a comprehensive medical and psychosocial evaluation, and the safety and well-being of the living donor is paramount. Living donor professionals are risk adverse when providing final clearance to proceed with donation. So everybody who comes forward, as I mentioned, to donate undergoes a medical and psychosocial evaluation. And the key components of that evaluation are a medical evaluation by a nephrologist who is a kidney specialist, social worker, physical exam, laboratory and radiological testing, health maintenance, age-appropriate screening tests, and organ-specific testing. And I'll go into those in a little more depth now. So each living donor has an a team that's independent from the recipient. And the members of that team are a nephrologist, who am I mentioned as a kidney specialist, a donor surgeon who performs the surgery, living donor coordinator who is the point person and coordinates the care through the continuum from beginning to end. They also provide the donor with support and education throughout the process. The social worker assesses the donor from a psychoso psychosocial perspective for motivation, social support. A living donor advocate is assigned to the team. This is somebody who is independent from the recipient team and advocates for the rights of the living donor. And many institutions have a financial coordinator who counsels the donor on the impact of donation on their life and health insurance. Everybody undergoes a general laboratory tests to assess their kidney function, confirm their blood types, make sure they're not anemic, check their cholesterol, and most importantly, check for any early signs of diabetes. If there is a family member with diabetes, we do additional testing to ensure that there are no early signs of diabetes. They're also assessed for coronary artery disease, and if necessary, if they have a history of smoking, may be referred to a pulmonologist for further evaluation. We are very concerned about the health of the kidney and the health of the person overall, but especially their kidney function prior to donation. So we do organ-specific testing. We make ensure there is no infection. There's no protein or albumin secretion in the urine. That can be a marker for early kidney dysfunction. As I mentioned, we look very closely to ensure there's no early signs of diabetes. We measure the kidney function through either a 24-hour urine collection or perhaps a nuclear GF4 study. We want to ensure that the donor is going into donation with kidney function sufficient for their age, height, and weight, as we do not want to create a long-term deficit for the donor. If there is a family history of polycystic kidney disease, we screen the donor for that prior to allowing them to donate. And they're also screened for kidney stones if the donor is de determined to be at risk for stones. A crucial component of the donor evaluation is radiological evaluation. All potential donors undergo a CAT scan, which assesses the anatomy and physiology of the, of the kidney, looks at size and structure, and blood vessels. Typically, a donor has 50-50% on each kidney. However, there are occasions where a person is born with one kidney smaller than the other. If that is the case, then a donor needs to undergo a renal scan, which assesses the split function of each kidney. For the most part, we leave the donor with the larger kidney, and the smaller one is given to the recipient. We do prefer that to have a left nephrectomy, as this is easier to access for the donor surgeon, and on the recipient side, given the length of the blood vessels, is easier to re-implant. 
As I mentioned earlier, UNOS provides each transplant professional with prescriptive policies and guidelines to which we need to adhere. And one of the crucial components of that policy is the informed consent of living donors. Education is important to enable the potential donor to understand all aspects of the donation process, especially the risks and benefits. And the goal here is to ensure that the donor understands fully that they will undertake risk and receive no medical benefit. There are general risks of operation and center-specific risks that are discussed in detail with each donor. And that health information is kept confidential as with any other medical record. What we want to ensure in, is a required elements of the informed consent is that the donor fully understands and we have assessed that they are willing to donate they are free from inducement and coercion, that they have been informed that they may decline to donate at any time throughout the process, even until the morning of surgery, and that they have an opportunity to discontinue the donor evaluation at any point also, and that all their medical records are again kept private and confidential. There are several myths out there about living donation, and I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but I will just touch upon some. So there is a myth that donors can't live normal, healthy lives after donation. That is not true. They can. We fully evaluate everybody prior to allowing them to donate. And if we do determine that there are contraindications to donating and we're putting them at high risk, then we will not clear somebody to donate. A donor cannot have children after donation. They can. We do ask that somebody waits at least six months post-donation to allow their body time to adjust to living with one kidney, and many people have gone on to have very successful pregnancies post-donation. Living donors don't choose whom they donate to. That is True and false. If a donor is entering paired exchange, they do not have the ability to choose to whom they are donating. However, in other circumstances, they can choose, be it their spouse, be it their friend, or whomever they wish to donate to. Living donors live a shorter life. That again is, not, is false. Donors tend to live a longer life. They tend to take much better care of themselves post-donation and hence have a better quality of life. The Catholic Church opposes organ donation. Again, that's false. The Catholic Church supports organ donation. Living donation can harm a person's sex life. Again, false. Most people resume normal relationships within two weeks of donating. Living donors are likely to get kidney disease. Again, false. As I mentioned earlier, a huge component of the donor evaluation is assessing the kidney function of the potential donor. If it's determined that that donor has any type of kidney disease, they will not be allowed to donate. Living kidney donors have to take anti-rejection medications. Again, false. Only recipients take anti-rejection medications. Donors usually take some pain medication for a couple of days after discharge, but other than that, do not need to take any long-term medication. Only a young person can donate. Very false. We have had numerous people in their 70s donate. My personal experience, my oldest donor that I helped get through the donation process was 78. He donated to his wife and lived a perfectly healthy life afterwards. People over the age of 50 cannot donate. As I mentioned, people into their 70s can donate. It is all about the health of the potential living donors. Gay people cannot donate. Very false. Of course they can donate. And people with tattoos cannot donate. That is false. However, we do, if somebody has gotten a tattoo recently, we do ask them to wait just a short period of time just to make sure there were no issues of transmission of any type of disease during that tattoo process. I just want to briefly touch upon confidentiality and discuss why it is so important that during the donor evaluation process that not just the regular confidentiality is maintained, but a higher level of confidentiality. It is crucial that the donor have an opportunity to undergo their evaluation 
without interference from family members or from the recipient or from anybody. Um, it is very important that they feel that they are the most important person in the room and that everything about them is kept confidential. Most transplant programs nowadays have separate living donor and recipient teams for this very reason. The members of the living donor team focus completely on the living donor and maintain their confidentiality. It develops a, builds a trust with the transplant program and the trans, their team and gives them an opportunity to make their decision about donating without any pressure or coercion from any outside influences. Not necessarily the recipient, it could be other family members, it could be their spouse, it could be many different people. But critically important that they have that opportunity and everything is kept confidential. I do want to remind you that we really do welcome your questions and comments for each of our speakers. Please use the YouTube chat feature and we'll be able to respond in a Zoom session one week from now. Yes. Now you've already met and heard from our executive director, Lisa Emmett. Fortunately for us and you, Lisa was also able to introduce our next expert speaker. Our next guest holds a special place in my heart as she was a critical player on the transplant team at Johns Hopkins Hospital in 2017 when my husband received a kidney in a paired kidney exchange involving eight transplant centers across the country. Janet Hiller started her career at Johns Hopkins in 1988 as a clinical nurse specialist for transplant. In 2000, she began developing their kidney paired donation program and for the next decade, Hopkins led the world in paired exchange innovation. Janet still presently serves in the Incompatible Kidney Transplant Program at Johns Hopkins Hospital, where they work closely with the National Kidney Registry to facilitate most of their paired kidney exchanges. Janet's dedication to her profession extends beyond the workplace, as she donated her own kidney in 2010 to a highly sensitized patient on the waiting list. She considers her donation experience to be life-changing in the most positive of ways. Proving that donating a kidney won't slow you down, Janet enjoys running races with her three daughters and bikepacking trips with her husband. We are extremely fortunate to have Janet's insight and expertise in the realm of kidney paired donation. Let's turn our attention to Janet Hiller. Thank you, Lisa, for that very kind introduction. So as my role uh, as a transplant coordinator, uh, my primary responsibilities include managing the kidney pair donation program and also preparing recipients for a living donor transplant. So many of you have been living donors or know the living donor process fairly well, but what I'd like to do is give you an idea of what the recipient or the potential uh, recipient goes through in terms of an evaluation for kidney transplant. So let's start and remember some background about renal failure. Remember the kidneys filter waste and excess water, keep bone and tissue healthy, and control blood pressure. When a patient develops kidney disease and then leads to renal failure, they will have a buildup of waste and excess fluid. There's many causes of kidney failure. The primary two causes of renal failure, however, are high blood pressure and diabetes. When a patient is presented with the diagnosis of renal failure, they are giving a few different options for treatment. One option is a transplant. One option is a type of dialysis, whether it be hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. And the other option is to do nothing. Today, we're, of course, we're talking about kidney transplantation. And how do, we, how do the patients actually get to the kidney transplant center? So patients can be referred by their primary care provider, their local nephrologist, or any other healthcare provider. Some patients actually are referred to a transplant center because they ended up in the emergency room having no idea they had kidney failure. That is not the ideal way to be referred to a transplant center, but it does happen. 
Patients also can self-refer. They can call up transplant center themselves once they know they have renal failure and start the process. So what I'd like to do is give you an overview of the transplant candidate evaluation and the role everyone on the transplant team plays in that evaluation. So the nurse transplant nurse coordinators, one of their primary role is to educate patients and their family and caregivers about kidney transplantation and what role they will play in promoting their transplant. The patients also will meet with transplant nephrologist, a social worker, a transplant surgeon, and of course the nurse coordinator. Each individual provider will spend almost an hour with the patients talking to them and educating them and answering questions. During the evaluation also, the nephrologist will indicate if this ca transplant candidate could have living donors evaluated. So in other words, this re ensures that a recipient or a potential candidate uh, is most likely eligible to receive a transplant prior to living donors beginning their evaluation. Also at an eva candidate evaluation, patients will have lab work done and maybe a couple other tests such as an EKG or a chest x-ray. Now, as I told you, the transplant coordinators, one of their primary roles is to educate the patients and the families. And so part of that education is to let patients know about the, f the waiting list in the United States. Currently, over 100,000 people wait for a kidney in the United States. The average wait time for a kidney is anywhere from three to five years. In each year, approximately 10% of the patients die while they wait on a transplant list. Many patients want to know, how long can I stay on dialysis? Well, patients can stay on dialysis for quite a long time. We know that some patients have lived up to 30 years on dialysis, but the average life expectancy of patients on dialysis is from five to 10 years. We explain to the patients some of the benefits and some of the risks of a kidney transplant. Now, of course, the benefits are an improved quality of life. The patients now can live life without the requirement of dialysis. It gives them much more freedom to travel, enjoy family activities, go back to work. And overall, patients tell us they feel better. There's also a decreased mortality and morbidity. In other words, patients will live longer and patients will have less long-term complications. Some of the risks involved in the kidney transplant are the, similar to any surgical procedure, and it's risks associated with anesthesia, bleeding, infection, um, complications related to the pr surgical procedure itself. Other risks involve those of being on lifelong immunosuppressant medication, and there's always a risk of rejection. We tell patients, despite how well matched they are, there's always a, a, a potential for them to experience an episode of rejection. We enforce the fact that rejection, when you hear the word rejection, it does not mean that you're going to lose the kidney. It means that you need to have your immunosuppressant medication adjusted, and it also means that we have to find out uh, what is the cause of um, your reduced kidney, kidney function. Patients, the other risk um, related to being on immunosuppressants is an increased chance of malignancy, skin cancer being the greatest um, malignancy occurrence. There's also the risk of infection because remember, when you're on immunosuppressant medications, this is gonna slow down your immune system so that it does not um, allow rejection to occur, but when your immune system is slowed down, then you have an increased risk of infection and acquiring viruses and bacteria, et cetera, that normally you might be able to fight off because your immune system is intact. So there's a fine line that we walk between too much immunosuppressive medication, which can lead to increased infection, and too little immunosuppressive medication, which then can increase your risk for rejection. 
There's also always a risk of graft failure and patients have to understand that despite everything, uh, doing everything correct, taking their medications as they um, are instructed, going to all their appointments, uh, just leading a healthy life, there is always a risk that the kidney could fail. And then finally, of course, there's the risk of death. Now, we also tell the patients about everything that's involved in the evaluation in order to be deemed a candidate for a kidney transplant. So the recipient's evaluation sometimes is this very similar to the living donor evaluation in the fact that you have to have a lot of lab work done, you'll have blood work done for your tissue typing to see what your genetic typing is, You'll have lab work done to see what viruses you have been exposed to throughout the course of your life, and much more lab work in terms of chemistries and blood work. Other testing that's, that's routinely done for a candidate is a cardiac stress test, a two-dimensional echocardiogram, chest x-ray, colonoscopy for patients who are over 50 years old, and for women, a mammogram and pap smear, again, depending on age. And some of the additional testing that's fairly routine, actually, is a CAT scan of your abdomen and pelvis. We want to see what the vasculature looks like to, make sure, to see if there's any calcification in the blood vessels in your abdomen and pelvis. We also want to see if there's any masses, any cysts, any stones. Um, anything that might cause concern or uh, make the sur transplant surgery a bit more complicated. Should any of the cardiology testing be abnormal, then you'll be referred for, to a cardiologist and most likely have a cardiac catheterization done. If a recipient has a diagnosis of polycystic kidney disease, then there's always an increased risk of a cerebral or a um, vascular abnormality in, their, in the brain. And in this case, we will then require an MRI or an MRA of the brain. And then we will also um, refer the patients for any other kind of consults that would be indicated based on their baseline testing. Now, once all the baseline testing is done and collected and reviewed, then the patient is ready to be presented to the listing committee at the transplant center. Every transplant center has listing committees. This committee is made up of various disciplines uh, of the transplant team, including nephrologists, surgeons, social workers, the transplant dietitian, transplant pharmacist, uh, transplant financial coordinator, transplant coordinators, nurse coordinators, and anyone else who is involved has been involved in the evaluation of this patient should uh, it be indicated, such as the transplant psychologist that may have been um, consulted. All these uh, members of the team will gather and discuss the uh, this patient's case and come to an agreement on the status of the patient. Should the status now will be, will we list the patient as active, meaning they're cleared to have a kidney um, offer, and also they'll be accruing time on the wait list. They could be listed as inactive, and in this case they are accruing time, but they're not eligible for a kidney offer. Perhaps it's because of a um, medical issue. Perhaps their BMI is over, over the transplant center's cutoff. Maybe there's some financial issues that have to still be straightened out. Perhaps the insurance company uh, or the insurance of the patient is not adequate and they need additional to um, apply for additional insurance. Sometimes it's because the, uh, a psychosocial issue Perhaps the caregiver has not been totally confirmed yet about who's going to take care of the patient after the transplant. So while the patient is inactive, typically it should be for a very short-term period, living donors may be evaluated during this time. But remember, 
the patients are not going to be offered a deceased donor kidney at this time, but they are still accruing wait time, which is really important to the recipients because they want to make sure that um, they're gaining time on the wait list so that they uh, will be offered a kidney as soon as possible. A patient can also be deemed not a candidate. And it's important to understand this and for the recipient to convey this to any potential living donors because living donors cannot be evaluated, typically are not evaluated during at, at this time because the recipient is not going to move on to um, transplant. Some of the reasons why this might happen and they are contraindications to kidney transplant is maybe it has been um, determined through all the testing that the patient has advanced cardiovascular disease. They could have an active malignancy that's been discovered. Uh, perhaps they're still actively abusing a substance. They could have, if they have active AIDS, they won't be a candidate. And also other indications could be a, a, a obesity with a BMI greater than 45. Now, this can be very transplant center specific. And so it'll be very important that the transplant nurse coordinators and the transplant team relay this information to the candidate. There are many instances where the transplant pa the patients think that they are active on a transplant list because they came to the transplant center for an evaluation appointment. And because of that, they might go back to their dialysis unit and say, yep, I'm on the list. I went to the transplant center and I'm on the list. But they actually are not, and patients uh, will find out if they are candidates for transplant from a call from their transplant nurse coordinator when that um, acceptance has been completed. Also, they, the transplant patient, that patient will now receive a letter in the mail confirming their acceptance for a transplant, and also that letter will go to their dialysis center as well as their nephrologist or primary care provider, letting those people know that the patient is now, now being active or perhaps they're inactive on the wait list and why are they inactive. All those people, including the patient, need to know the status of the, um, the patient so that they can help this patient move forward to transplant should there be some reasons to be inactive. We discuss with the patient while they're at their evaluation um, what the average wait time is for a deceased donor kidney. Now, patients always want to know how long will they have to wait for a transplant. When we tell them how long they might have to wait for a transplant, it's a great lead-in for them to, to also realize that waiting for a deceased donor kidney is very, very long. And it would behoove them greatly if they would seek out and st uh, living donors and share their situation and their need for a kidney with other family members, perhaps friends, or find someone within their family or their friend or social circle who can advocate on their behalf for a living donor. As you see here from this slide in the chart, you'll see that um, according to blood type, your weight could be longer or shorter. If your blood type is O, you'll median, the average wait time for an O blood type recipient would be five years. If, it's, if your blood type is A, it'll be th around three years and some months. If your blood type is B, it's also a very long wait because B is a rather uncommon blood type and so it's uncommon to have as many deceased donors. And so for a B uh, patient, they might wait five years or more. If your blood type is AB, you're in a much better situation because your wait time is the shortest. The reason why these, these wait times according to blood type are such is because if your blood type is O, you can only accept an O blood type kidney if you're going to receive a compatible kidney. If your blood type is A, you can receive both an A blood type kidney and an O blood type kidney. The O blood type is a universal donor. An O blood type patient can donate their kidney to any blood type for a compatible kidney. 
If your recipient's blood type is B, they can receive a B blood type kidney and an O blood type kidney. If your recipient's blood type is AB, they can receive an A kidney, a B kidney, an O kidney, or an AB kidney. So you can see why the um, wait time for an AB recipient might be a bit shorter. Now also patients want to know when their um, waiting time will start. So for a recipient who's on dialysis, even if they've been on dialysis for four years before they come to the transplant center, their wait time starts at the day that they first started dialysis. So the dialysis start date is when your listing date begins. Now, if you're not on dialysis yet and you come to the transplant center, you get evaluated, you get cleared to receive a kidney transplant, and your kidney function is below what we call 20. It's 20 is a G, uh, the other term for kidney function that we use is glomerular filtration rate or GFR. As long as it's documented to 20 or below, then that's when your listing date will start. When your when your excuse me kidney function reaches 20 or below. Now, let's say your recipient has now um, told you that they have lots of living donors who would like to, to try and donate for them. So what does the recipient coordinator do in this case? What we tell our recipients then is to have anyone who is interested in giving you a living donor kidney to call the living donor office. The recipient team cannot call your living donor. Your recipient team is focused on the recipient. So it's very important that the recipient understands that they have to tell the living donors that they need to call the living donor office to begin the donor process. Our living donor team cannot call your, living do your potential donors because it must be, that whole process must be stimulated by the living donor themselves. So as, once your recipient is uh, ready for a transplant or working through the process of getting a transplant and there's living donors who are calling your living donor office to get evaluated, so that then the recipient is going to be focused very carefully on to make sure that they're ready for a transplant when the donor has been cleared and ready to go to the operating room. So the goal here is to have consistent communication between the living donor and recipient teams. Now that does not mean that the recipient team is involved in the evaluation of the living donor. All it means is that we both teams know what's going on with their own patients so that we can be ready at the same time. So we want our goal so that our donors are ready and the recipient is ready simultaneously. And readiness is really improved when the living donor teams and recipient teams can meet on a regular basis. What we want to avoid is that the potential recipient is not a candidate or in need of prolonged treatment or testing and the living donor is cleared to donate and is waiting for six months, nine months, whatever, to be trans to give, have their donation take place. So here I give you an example of the workflow to encourage both the donor and recipient to be ready about the same time for their transplant and there not be a delay. So at our transplant center, we um, will, you'll see here that the recipient team is working to, to prepare the recipient as the donor team is working to prepare donors. You'll see on the left here under the recipient column, the recipient will go to the evaluation clinic and the nephrologist will document it that, that living donors may be evaluated. That information is provided to the donor team in case any donors, potential donors, contact their office wanting to donate for this recipient. Once the donor contacts the living donor office, the donor will complete a questionnaire. The coordinators will review that questionnaire and uh, if 
there are no red flags or no contraindications, then the donor will receive screening lab work, prescriptions, and also have a medical psychosocial review. The recipient will complete their evaluation testing during the same period of time, and the donor team will be made aware of any concerns or anything that, that would prolong a, 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 excuse me, prolong a recipient's evaluation. Once the candidate is activated on the deceased donor list, then the living donor recipient coordinator is assigned the case. Why that happens is so that then there can be a lot of attention placed on this recipient to make sure that they are actually ready to go to the transplant. The donor, in the meantime, um, is doing all their initial screening uh, lab work and testing that needs to be done. The donor and recipient pair then is discussed at our weekly team meeting. Now, why is the donor and recipient pair discussed together at the team meeting? The main reason is to determine the compatibility between the donor and the recipient. Now, when I talk about compatibility, I don't mean just HLA matching or tissue type matching that you hear. Most people hear about a six antigen match or a zero match or a three out of six match, which is all fine, that's all HLA matching. But that's not the only factor that goes into compatibility between donor and recipient. We also take a look at the size of the donor and the size of the recipient. For example, if the donor is five foot two, 110 pounds, and a female, and the recipient is six foot five, 250 pounds, and a male, we might consider that size of the, the donor to be rather small to, to take care of the needs of the recipient. Another factor that we look at for compatibility is the age difference between the donor and the recipient. Many times a grandparent might come forward as a donor for their grandchild, which is a wonderful thing, but the age difference is significant. And so we might, we might look at that age difference and say that's not really compatible and the best situation for the recipient for long-term function of this kidney. We also take a look at the anatomy of both the donor kidney that's going to be donated and the recipient's vasculature. Many recipients, if they're older or they're on their second or third kidney transplant, they'll have some vascular issues that would make it a little bit more difficult to find the best placement for the kidney. If the donor anatomy tends to be a bit more complicated, such they have multiple blood vessels um, or uh, an unusual anatomy, or perhaps even they'll look at the kidneys to see if there's stones in the kidney. One stone typically is acceptable in a kidney, multiple stones is not. Um, or if there's stones in both kidneys, that one might eliminate a living donor, but it's all up to the living donor team. But we'll take a look at the anatomy and we'll make sure that if the donor has to, for example, donate their right kidney and the blood vessels are a bit shorter than a left kidney, and the um, recipient's vasculature is such that there's not a lot of places to put a kidney. We might say, let's try and get a different kidney for that recipient because remember, the goal with a kidney transplant is to keep it as long as possible. So whatever we can do to encourage long life of the kidney is what we wanna do. Okay, so moving on in the process then, we see that we, we take the recipient and make sure there's no other additional testing now that's needed. The donor goes through their entire evaluation day and any additional testing that needs to take place, such a measured um, kidney function test or split function tests to see which kidney, if there's a kidney that's larger than the other, um, all those testing will be done. The recipient will see the transplant surgeon, have a lot more education by the transplant nurse. Any consents that are needed will be obtained. And then when the donor team notifies the recipient team that the donor has been cleared for donation, then the recipient, um, the transplant can be either scheduled if they're going to go together, meaning that donor, 
goes to that recipient, or this pair will be entered into an exchange database, um, a paired exchange database, in order to find um, a more compatible kidney for this recipient. So at this point, I'm going. we'd like to discuss um, a few case studies with you to show, uh, actually exemplify what both Marion from the Living Donor Team and myself have been talking about. So to highlight our focus on confidentiality throughout both of our presentations, we have some case studies that we would like to review and discuss so that you under, fully understand what we mean by confidentiality and the importance of it. So the first case study um, I'm going to present is a 26-year-old female who has end-stage renal disease secondary to polycystic kidney disease. She's not yet on dialysis. Her kidney function is stable at around 16 to 17 GFR. But her primary nephrologist begins discussing dialysis access, which completely freaks out this 26-year-old young woman, as you can well understand. There is a family history of polycystic kidney disease. Her father received a transplant back in 2008. So she launches a social media campaign through Facebook. And on day one of the campaign, we got over 30 calls. On day two, we got over 50. And then day three, we got over 20. And it did continue on. But just to highlight the volume of calls we received for this young woman, which was tremendous, but in itself created some problems. In the meantime, both her mother and her aunt had come in to be evaluated and unfortunately medically ruled out. And this is when the real issues began with this case. So the living donor staff received almost hourly hysterical phone calls from the recipient's father. Remember that this gentleman had received a transplant himself in 2008, stating that my daughter is dying, your team is incompetent, how come nobody ever it, nobody, and after everybody is getting evaluated and of course we're explaining we've had numerous calls we need to work through each person reach back out to them but he was not hearing any of this so eventually a young friend came forward a 24 year old potential donor who was her friend since first grade donor lived out of state we scheduled her evaluation according to her wishes and sent her the appointment letter. I don't think the email had hit her inbox when we received a phone call from the recipient's father again. Now, numerous conversations had gone on discussing confidentiality and HIPAA with this gentleman, but it just was not sinking in. And obviously we can understand his anxiety as the father of this young woman. Mm -hmm. But he was saying to us, you're killing my daughter, mm -hmm. you're you know, your team is incompetent, the same theme as, as previously. So the donor completed her workup and was medically cleared. Her motivation when assessed by the social worker and the ILDA was very clear. She wanted to help her friend. You could see that they had a very close relationship. But during the evaluation, she did tell our social worker and ILDA, ILDA that the father was driving her crazy. She did request a timeout um, to allow her some time to just breathe, discuss her decision with her family without interference from the recipient or her father. That was, we reached out to the family, the recipient team reached out to the family and got that permission. I will say it happened very reluctantly. Um, the donor did decide to go forward. As a side note, um, COVID hit and this donor did not donate till three months later. Mm. So she had more than a two week timeout. But Janet, my question to you as a recipient coordinator, mm -hmm. how would you have handled that father? Because not only was he breaching HIPAA con and confidentiality for the donor and the donor team, mm -hmm. but he was also sort of breaching his daughter's mm -hmm. confidentiality and HIPAA. So how, how would you as a recipient coordinator deal with that? Well, that's, it is a really tough, tough situation. Um, and I think what your team did was exactly what our team would have done. Um, as a recipient coordinator, we would have probably talked with the social worker, the recipient social worker, made sure that the, the social worker was aware of what was going on, and then called the recipient, talked to her about 
confidentiality. What can, what are you comfortable with us sharing? And also to find out if she, if she actually is comfortable with her father knowing all this information. She is 26 years old, so she had to sign um, an agreement or a, a permission slip saying that it was okay to share her information with specific people. And so kind of reinforce that with her again to make sure she knew that. Um, and you know, then of course I would think that the also the donor social worker obviously mm -hmm. was very involved. Absolutely. And you know, I think that would probably be the way to handle it. Yeah. But always with the understanding that if you coming from if you're coming from the recipient's shoes and, and the father's shoes, that you realize where all this is coming from, which is just anxiety and wanting the best for their child. So um, I think we can do it really compassionately, even though very firmly at the same time. I think though it does highlight the, the necessity for independent donor and recipient mm -hmm. teams. Exactly. The donor has somebody in their corner looking out for their best interests and then the recipient also. Exactly right, yep. So my second case study is similar, but um, a, a little different. So we have a 37-year-old recipient whose cause of end-stage renal is IgA nephropathy, came on very sudden. He is married with one son. Um, he originally came from the Ukraine, and most of his family are still there. Um, the only people here are his wife and his child. His wife did come forward as a donor, but unfortunately ruled out secondary to gestational diabetes. He launched a social media campaign using the NKR micro site and Facebook. And we had numerous responses, but unfortunately some of them were not medically or psychosocially mm -hmm. cleared to proceed and ruled out. He, um, as time went on, this campaign ran for several weeks, maybe even months, and as time went on, he became very frustrated and began, you know, I don't want to say harassing, but almost harassing the living donor team with emails and calls. Have these donors registered? If not, why not? Are you just not calling them back? Are you people are incompetent? The usual things that, that we hear. Um, and then if we did evaluate a donor, why did you rule them out? What is the reason behind it? I need my kidney. Why mm -hmm. are you ruling out my donors? Mm -hmm. And it became a very, very difficult situation. So, and I don't have the answers here to this one. You have a social media campaign, and it's actually a balancing act. You have the recipient's need for a kidney. He did social media campaign, which is what we encourage our recipients to do but it did put undue pressure on the team and undue pressure on those donors mm -hmm. that were mm -hmm. registering. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the right answer? How best do you maintain this donor confidentiality mm -hmm. in the setting of a social media campaign and recipient hope? With mm -hmm. the other case, it was more family, Facebook friends, people that were known to that particular mm -hmm. recipient, but in this case, it's complete strangers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what would you on the recipient side, like mm -hmm. how would you keep this guy's hope up? Oh, this is really hard, and I think um, it ties in really well with the next case study that comes mm -hmm. up, and perhaps we can try and answer the question uh, sure. at that point. So, um, okay, so we'll, we'll try the next uh, case study. So this case study is a patient that I knew, um, he initially started calling the donor office, inquiring about the status of his pot potential donors. Um, he was told that um, he was unable to have this information because of HIPAA rules. So he began calling a nurse manager every other week um, to determine the status of the living donors and express increasing desperation with his illness and the unknown. He again was in the same similar situation to your young person where he had polycystic kidney disease and he was not yet on dialysis and was trying to avoid dialysis as much as possible. And on the other bi-weekly, um, <laughs> uh, the bi-weeks, uh, he called the recipient coordinator, which would be me, to for the same reasons, to try and find out more information. And the only information provided was there were a few donors moving through the process. So, um, 
he, the recipient, actually had long conversations with myself and said, I don't want to know the names of the people, but I think the healthcare provider team should create a spreadsheet that's completed when the donors reach each step of the process and then share that with the recipient, but no names can, are required. And ask the donor if they want their information shared with the recipient and indicate if a donor has been rejected. Some donors are not comfortable telling the patient that, so the recipient could find out through the transplant coordinator. And also for the healthcare provider to give donors deadlines so they'll get their, their work up done. Um, so uh, that was what our patient de recipient desired. And after many conversations with the recipient, um, always expressing the understanding, I know you're, you're you know, facing some unknowns. It's been a long time. There actually were um, two donors. I think in the next slide you'll see. Um, oh, okay, maybe it's not here. But two donors were approved. One who was incompatible and entered the exchange with this recipient, and another donor who took a long time to be approved because she lived out of town, mm -hmm. and it took a long time for her to get her testing done but she was eventually um, approved. So he had about 17 donors that he actively recruited for himself. Nine were automatically ruled out due to medical issues. Mm -hmm. uh, four were put on hold because their blood types weren't compatible, mm -hmm. while this compatible donor who eventually got cleared was um, went through their evaluation. Mm -hmm. And so because of the length of time it took for the donor to get fully evaluated and get her testing done, that just increased his anxiety mm -hmm. about how long things are taking. And recipients have a really difficult time when they're waiting for six and nine months for donors mm -hmm. to get evaluated. And the best thing that we can do as coordinators really, from, in my, from my experience is to just keep talking to them and telling them people are moving through the process, but it, we have no control over when they're going to do their testing because it's right. totally donor derived, you know. And I think from a donor perspective, I always find it difficult and challenging that quite often, and I'm sure you've seen this in your practice, quite often donors who respond to social media campaigns mm -hmm. do so on the spur of the moment. Mm -hmm. Maybe right. it's two o'clock and they just got in from the bar and that sounds yeah. like a cool thing to do, but when you wake up at seven o'clock and you have a hangover, it's not such a cool thing to do. So I it's think true. setting realistic expectations mm -hmm. when entering, when recipients start these social media campaigns yeah. is just vitally important. It's really good that you bring that up because that's also should be part of a recipient education that, you know, you might, you know, get started on a campaign, but you can be sure that you know, when it comes down to it, only 10% of people who actually call Correct. living donor offices ever become living donors. So, and yes, now my next case study uh, was also another, another situation where the recipient coordinator and recipient team um, kind of was under the impression that the donor and the recipients were communicating very closely and sharing information. So the recipient coordinator met with, a, with the patient and his wife at the time of a surgical evaluation. They talked about the potential living donors and who was moving forward. Uh, the recipient shared one donor's uh, medical history, and that's the cousin, uh, and mentioned that he had to work on his cholesterol and his blood pressure, but was willing to move forward. So the coordinator with this information assumed the two of them were discussing things uh, because he was sharing medical information with the recipient. So the coordinator shared tissue typing results with the patient that had the donor's name and tissue typing on it, the, co the cousin's name and tissue typing on the same piece of paper to show the, um, the match results. The patient then shared this tissue typing results with the donor, which is the, the cousin, mentioning that they were told they were a good match. And also because of the assumption that the two of them were talking and um, that this was uh, knowledge that they would, would both agree to have shared, the transplant surgeon also shared the same information with, with the recipient and his wife. 
However, the donor contacted the donor team the very next day, was really upset that the information was shared, his information was shared. And so the recipient coordinator immediately notified the HIPAA office to mention what had happened. Um, so um, uh, just for basic knowledge, <laughs> uh, recipients in our practice oftentimes will contact the recipient coordinator stating that they talked with their donor and were told that the donor is cleared and willing to move forward and they were just waiting for the donor team to as to the next step. And with that information in mind, the recipient coordinator to not slow down the process will be might proceed down a certain pathway. Mm -hmm. um, Oftentimes, so the donor said the donor team will tell us then no, the donor's really not cleared. They must have misunderstood something, and this does set up a stage for mistrust mm -hmm. between the donor and the recipient, and the donor and the donor team and the recipient team. Um, so in this case, the recipient coordinator felt that the recipient and donor were in close contact with each other since medical histories were being shared, but the donor now felt he was under pressure to continue as a living donor. Yeah, and that so. that does create. A, a problem. I mean, on the donor side, when mm -hmm. we're educating, we do encourage people to share with the recipient. It becomes difficult when it's altruistic mm -hmm. or if it's a co-worker, they may not want mm -hmm. to share, they may not have that close relationship. And I think it is a, a challenge across the spectrum of transplant, the mm -hmm. donor-recipient relationship, and one that we as professionals cannot always solve and, mm -hmm. and I think we'll always have this, this issue. Mm -hmm. But again, it goes back to the fact that the donor must have time to make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. They must have their time out, not feel under pressure. And quite often when scenarios like this happen, this is what causes potential donors to back away from mm -hmm. the process. Right, right. Um, can we solve it? I don't think we can solve it, but it's hopefully you were able to get some in insight into the challenges we as coordinators face when evaluating both donors and recipients. Mm -hmm. So actually we wanted to just kind of tie this little section up right here is what really can the transplant discuss with the recipient? So the transplant team obviously has to respect confidentiality of both the donor as well as the recipient. And some of the allowed communication, it would be, there are so many potential donors who have called on your behalf. So we can say, for example, with my case, 17 donors have called on your behalf. And then the next time they call to find out what the progress is, if they call again, you can say, well, there's nine potential donors who are going through the evaluation process or moving forward through the process. But that's all we can say. We can encourage do potential donors to talk with their re intended recipient. Sometimes though, if again, if it's an unusual or a stressful relationship, that's not going to happen. But that's all we can tell a recipient. So with this knowledge, hopefully you'll be able to um, understand what you know the donors and the recipients are going through. So the way we look at donation, I'll let Janet round her piece out. So what we, we look at transplant as a means to a better quality of life for most end-stage renal disease patients and also a greater um, resource management. So if you have a living donor and the living donor is able to give a kidney to you, then that's one less person who's on the deceased donor waiting list for those scarce resources. And we also know that with living donation, We'll, the recipient um, will have an improved um, uh, lifespan and a much greater lifespan. And from a donor perspective, being a living donor allows that donor an opportunity to see their recipient live a longer, healthier life. They pay it forward for their loved ones. And living donation makes more deceased organs available for those people who do not have an opportunity to receive a living donor transplant. Mm -hmm. So often we get a, the question from the recipients about why are you not testing all 50 donors that have come forward? Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important for recipients to understand that we as transplant programs and transplant professionals have some constraints that do, do not allow us to test that number of people. One is that 
insurance companies mm -hmm. may not uh, or may be difficult to justify to insurance companies why are we testing 50 people they will not clear 50 donor mm -hmm. evaluations can we do compatibility testing on a number of donors yes we can but the actual medical workup which on average can cost anywhere between eight to ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars for a donor mm -hmm. insurance companies will just not approve that number of people mm -hmm. to be tested typically at, at my center we will start with five and we usually start with close family members maybe cousins aunts uncles that kind of thing that we know that there potentially is mm -hmm. a genetic match if among those five somebody medically clears and is willing to move forward we then stop the process mm -hmm. we do however go back to all the donors that registered and offer them an opportunity to maybe do advanced donation mm -hmm. for that recipient or perhaps they want to become a non-directed mm -hmm. donor and start a chain within a paired exchange mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. how how can you deal with it on your recipient side yeah so that is definitely a concern of the recipients and uh, where I work we will test three donors um, initially but if those of those three donors um, people still continue to call and want to be tested we will allow them to have blood types done so that we can mm -hmm. see if there's any donors who are um, an O blood type perhaps who will help this recipient um, be transplanted sooner or uh, especially if the donors who have already um, the three donors who have already come forward are not compatible with that donor um, and they don't you know they'll help them get a kidney through an exchange quicker if they are an O blood type donor so we'll, we will do that we have to explain to the recipient though that we can only test three at a time and again it's for the same reasons Marion that you just mentioned which is cost um, it's not a, just an open-ended um, stream of money that comes from the insurance companies. We really, we need to work within the constraints of our, of our financial system in the hospital. Yeah, and it's also the resources within your living mm -hmm. donor team. We not only have that recipient, mm -hmm. we have numerous other recipients mm -hmm. who have potential living donors. We had a case a couple of years ago of somebody who did a social media campaign and over the course of a weekend we had 1,200 donors respond. Now that's humanly impossible for mm -hmm. any living donor team on Monday morning to reach out to those 1,200 mm -hmm. people. So mm -hmm. it can be a matter of resources within the living donor team exactly. also. And I also want to mention that sponsored organizations are playing a critical role in the success of this Volunteer Living Donor Advocacy Conference. And in that context, I'd like to highlight the valuable guidance and support we have received from CareDx, your partner in transplant care, as well as from Veloxis, Nora, Equinox, Vineyard Vines, VRL Eurofins, Brooks and Philatico, Oomph, Maritime Partners, and Sanofi Genzyme.